continuing here with our classification of different organisms, starting here with the classification of prokaryotes. So a prokaryotic species by definition, so the species definition is a population of cells with similar characteristics. So, well, that is still leaves some room for, you know, some, some possibilities. So here are certain things that we need to know. When we are growing a colony, an isolated colony, then we're producing a clone. So we're starting out with a single parent. So this is the definition of a clone. A clone would be a population of cells derived from a single parent. That single parent started out on our petri dish and then a whole colony grew, grew and that is a clone. They are all genetically identical. However, um, there are still strains within, let's say, E. coli, for example, and just about all bacteria. They have different strains. So you've heard of the one E. coli strain that make you can make you really sick, the O157H7 strain. Um, there are slight genetic their variations within that species, and so a strain is genetically different. Um, from another strain of the same species. So O157H7 is a different strain of E. coli than the one that populates your gut normally. So uh, there are many strains of E. coli, most of them are non-pathogenic, but there are some pathogenic strains. Okay, so that's the difference between clone and strain. Okay, and what we call something a culture uh, when we grow bacteria using laboratory media, such as broth or um, agar plates. Okay, now let's take a look at the phylogenetic relationship among the prokaryotes. So we have two domains here, the archaea and the bacteria. Uh, maybe let's start over here with the archaea because they, it's, um, there's only three branches here. We have the hyperthermophiles that like extra hot, the methanogens that produce methane gas, and then we have the extreme halophiles, those are the salt lovers. And um, while they would be very interesting to study, it's really not that much research to be done on these archaea because there's just no money going into research on these. They don't make us sick. They don't. Um, they're not really used for big industrial processes. So um, people kind of have sidelined them. This whole domain here of organisms that would be highly interesting. But anyway, so we know quite a bit more about bacteria. They have really studied, especially the ones that make you sick. Uh, so can make us sick. Now let's start out here on the bottom. We have the bacteroides and some thermatoga. Um, then we have the green sulfur bacteria, um, green non-sulfur bacteria, and then here is, this sounds a little bit more familiar, the spirochetes, the chlamydias, those are intracellular parasites basically, those are bacteria that live inside of other eukaryotic cells. Then we have the proteobacteria, which is a huge group. The um, of gram negatives. Uh, so that's a humongous group of bacterial species right here hidden in these proteobacteria. Then we have cyanobacteria. They are bluish green. They are prokaryotes. They are true bacteria, but they can photosynthesize. So some people confuse them with algae, but they're not algae. So algae are uh, eukaryotic cells. And then we have all of the gram positives, all the gram positive bacteria, and they're subdivided into those with a high GC content versus low GC content and that refers to the nucleotides of their genome so G and C is uh, guanine and cytosine sort of the content of G and C in their genomes okay uh, moving on here to classification sort of the overview of the eukaryotes of course we have these um, four kingdoms among the eukaryotes uh, the protista the fungi plants and animals and the protista is uh, sort of a grab bag category of single celled um, single celled eukaryotes so they are either um, algae like because they are autotrophic they photosynthesize and we refer to them as more plant like protista so they're algae or they're heterotrophic then we call them more animal like protista and that's usually referred to as protozoa Okay, the fungi, it's a group of uh, chemoheterotrophic cells. Uh, they can be unicellular, like yeast, or multicellular, like a, a fungus. Uh, they have, the cell walls contain um, chitin, and they dev develop spores and these hyphae, hypho fragments. 
plants, um, well, your typical green plants, uh, they're multicellular, have cellular cell walls, and uh, they have photo they do photosynthesis, so they feed themselves using photosynthesis. And then animals are multicellular, have their cells have no cell walls, and they are all chemoheterotrophic, that means they need to feed on others. How about the viruses? Uh, they're not part of any domain because uh, people don't really put them sort of into the tree of life. Um, they don't really are considered life. On the other hand, hey, we do know that we can kill a virus. So if we can kill it, then it must have been alive before. But that's sort of a controversial issue. And we have a whole lecture on viruses to come. But um, because they're not composed of cells, they are not really classified in any kind of domain or a kingdom. Uh, we do, however, have viral species, and it's all based on the genetic material um, that they carry. So these um, populations of viruses with similar characteristics, that would be a viral species, and they occupy a particular ecological niche. Nowadays, the, all the viruses, it's all just really um, categorized by their genetic material. And here are some more learning objectives, a couple things to point out uh, what we will be talking about. Uh, we're going to briefly cover Berge's manual, sort of that's the gold that used to be the gold standard for uh, classifying uh, microorganisms, uh, bacteria in particular. I don't believe too many people are still using Berge's manual for classification. Everything is digitized these days. And so Berge's manual is this huge, um, just... Uh, a very large book, actually a series of books, where it's de descriptive bacteriology and it describes all of the different biochemical tests and what different, how different species react. So anyway, um, we will be talking briefly about um, more molecular biology methods such as western blotting and uh, southern blotting. Southern blotting, we're looking for DNA, and western blotting, uh, we're looking for particular proteins that might be present in certain cells. Okay, uh, nowadays pretty much everything is done uh, by looking at the genetics. Um, not many people do, well, serological tests, they have sort of still their own niche, but um, it's not that much anymore. Everybody's doing PCR these days. Um, even, I don't know if you know, but the COVID-19 test, it's a RT-PCR test, and we'll talk some more about it when we get to that chapter, but um, a PCR is stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's a quick and very efficient way to test um, for the presence of uh, certain genetic material, and it confirms uh, species, basically. So it's a cool, very cool method that's very widely used, and it's easy to do and fast the results, so it's, um, it's really the way to go. But um, so um, we're going to take a look at how we can classify uh, microorganisms based on the DNA based composition, DNA fingerprinting, and PCR in particular. And there's other um, methods that are that are of relevance, so nucleic acid hybridization, such as southern blotting or northern blotting, then we have DNA chips, ribotyping, and fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is abbreviated as FISH. Um, dichotomous keys, I don't know if anybody's using these anymore these days, but cladograms are still okay. Um, yeah, and normally in a microbiology lab, you would be identifying a sort of an unknown, and you don't get to do that, although we do have our mystery plates of the stuff that we've been culturing, so who knows what we've been culturing. Um, if we were able to do some biochemical tests, then we could just really try to classify what we are dealing with, what we've swapped from our environment. Uh, largely, it's going to be some unknowns, and they're going to remain pretty much unknown because we don't have the... the um, the materials that we would need in order to really classify those um, those microorganisms. Yeah, again, some Berge's manual. That's uh, that is a huge uh, set of books, very thick books, and um, people used to use them a lot. I nowadays I think everything is just digitized and is found on the internet or on different websites and. It's so much easier to access uh, things like that. But Berge's manual for the longest time it used to be a very useful resource for classifying uh, bacteria. Okay, and the methods of classification. 
Well, there's different methods. So in clinical microbiology, um, if let's say you have a patient and the patient is affected by some unknown illness, then you're going to try to take samples and you're going to try to figure out what this patient is infected with. Uh, first, you have to figure out if it's a virus or a bacterium, but let's say it's a bacterium and you're reasonably sure it's a bacterium. You might fill out one of these um, microbiology requisition sheets and ask for certain tests to be done to identify what that patient might have gotten sick from. So you have here a template and then you can, as a clinician, you can uh, request a gram stain report, a morphological study, you can um, you know, just uh, request different type of um, testing to be done to sort of get to the bottom of what somebody is afflicted with. Now, every test costs money. A lot of times, unfortunately, insurance will dictate what kind of tests can be done or cannot be done. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at sort of a basic kind of way of classifying um, microorganisms. And definitely what we will be doing next week, um, the staining, the gram stain in particular, those are very important tests sort of to get a first idea of what am I dealing with. Um, the morphological characteristics, um, they will tell you whether you're dealing with a rod, with a caucus, if it's a streptococcus, staphylococcus, or the arrangement in general. And so the morphological characteristics, they, they're useful as an initial idea of what am I dealing with. Um, they do not tell much about the phylogenetic relationships though. So um, something that we'll be doing next week, in a couple weeks actually, um, is differential staining. And in the most useful and longest lasting and still high in the rankings, um, differential stain is clearly the gram stain. That's what every microbiology student needs to learn, a gram stain, because it distinguishes uh, bacteria based on their cell wall characteristics. And so we have the gram positives and the gram negatives, and it has very large implications about how you can treat um, a, an infection that is caused by either gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Um, there are also acid fast uh, bacteria. Um, they don't even decolorize when you're using acid alcohol, and that uh, gives them um, very specific cell wall properties. They contain mycolic acid. And that is those are bacteria that are very difficult to treat and they're very resistant to a lot of antibiotics, for example. So that's why tuberculosis is such a problem. And now these new strains of tuberculosis, they are uh, even resistant to um, even the last antibiotic that we still have on the shelf. So it's pretty dangerous. Um, Okay, and uh, biochemical tests, those are the tests that we would normally do in the lab, but uh, we will not have the capacity to do those. So I'm going to show you those the theoretically how those are done. And um, so basically here is some um, sort of a um, sheet where you distinguish or you start differentiating out different bacteria based on their uh, metabolic characteristics. So you run these uh, metabolic tests or these biochemical tests. So you might want to grow your bacteria in a lactose broth and see can they ferment lactose and you come back with a yes no answer. They can either can or they cannot. And um, normally in the lab we would do that. We would have different types of sugars and then inoculate them with bacteria and um, these sugar broth and see if the bacteria can actually process or metabolize these different sugars. We have usually lactose, uh, glucose, mannitol, those kind of things. But anyway, so uh, then if the answer to the ferment lactose is no, then you would maybe further ask, can they use citric acid as an acidic um carbon source and then you come back with a yes or no answer and that then narrows down the options that you have and what you're dealing with so you might deal with a salmonella type of bacterium if um if it actually can use citric acid so um if the answer to the ferment lactose was yes then you also ask can they f use citric acid as their carbon source and um then the answer is then either yes or no. If uh, the answer to the citric acid was no, but they can ferment sorbitol, which is a different type of carbohydrate, then you might deal with E. coli or with other Escherichia species. Um, if the answer to the 
citric acid question was yes, then uh, you might end, end up dealing with Citrobacter or Enterobacter. So I think you get the idea. Uh, here is um, a profile showing, based starting out with a gram reaction, you either have gram positive or gram negative. So I'm still a sort of a dual answer, it's either positive or negative. Then you're looking at the morphology, am I dealing with rods or coxy? And if the gram reaction was negative, you might ask yourself, how about oxidase? Are the oxidase positive or negative? Can they hydrolyze urea or citrate? Um, is indole produced? All of these kind of things. So these are biochemical tests. And I don't want to get too hung up with this. So um, there are, you can do these tests, these biochemical biochemical tests uh, sort of separately each one or there are now these multi-test systems that will give you multiple answers very quickly uh, in particular what i'm talking about is the api 20 system in that case you're going to have a test strip that has mini wells in which you grow your bacteria and then so these are all the tests that are being run on that one strip and then uh, you depending on whether your reaction is going to be positive or negative you're assigning numbers and eventually literally these numbers they will key out the species so here um, these code numbers so here in this case we have six two three five three and that's based on whether these particular reactions were positive or negative that key, keys out to a code number and the code code number keys out to a microorganism so these are nice because you get multiple tests done in one sort of multi well test strip and it gives you the answer pretty quickly without a lot of fuss of them running a bunch of all these tests um tests separately okay let's take a look at serology um um, there you're looking at um, an antibody antigen interaction and so um, microorganisms they are antigenic that means they cause your immune system to produce antibodies and so uh, then you can take um, a look at somebody's serum and see if these people have produced um, antibodies and then you can test for um, whether they were exposed to a certain microorganism so that's serology you can also do it with serology you can do a slide agglutination test um, if you've ever gotten tested um, for TB tuberculosis uh, that is uh, so testing for whether you have antibodies against mycobacterium tuberculosis and so uh, either if you were vac vaccinated or if you uh, were or actually had the disease or have the disease then you will react to the anti-serum that they were putting that they're pinching under your skin and you will get an itchy little um you know a bump growing there on your skin that shows that you have antibodies um, in your serum so you can also do it um uh, with a slight agglutination test so there's different you can really um see with serological testing you're looking for the presence of this this antibody antigen interaction here's an example for the slight agglutination test you can see here there's definitely an agglutination this is a positive test so agglutination means a clumping reaction you can see these particles right here no clumping over here so this is a negative test also part of the serology looking at the presence of antigens or antibodies is a very popular test and that's the ELISA test. Um, so the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, E-L-I-A. So and there's actually two here. Enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, abbreviated as ELISA. And there you can either do a direct or an indirect ELISA test depending on whether you're looking for the antigen or the antibody somebody has but either way um, it's serology and we're looking for this antibody antigen interaction we'll talk some more about ELISA later in this course uh, western blotting there you're looking also for the presence of a particular antibody so the protein that somebody may have in their serum and here is uh, sort of somebody doing an ELISA test they're done in these micro well plates we actually used to do in micro 22 we always did an ELISA test at the end of this course so we probably have to do it theoretically i think labster has an ELISA test and here is a sort of a quick run what an ELISA test entails so we have the antibody here is put into the well right here so in this case we're looking for the presence of um 
in a direct ELISA, we're detecting the antigen. So we're putting on purpose, we're taking, uh, putting the antibody on the bottom of the well. We're coating the, the, this little microtiter well with the antibody. And then we're looking for whether that a patient has in their blood has the antigen that will interact with this um, antibody. So we could, for example, look for a particular virus or bacterium that may be present in that patient's body fluids. And then usually you need to have a detection mechanism. So if this antigen interacted with this antibody that I put down here on the well, then we come in with a secondary antibody that will detect this antigen. And it has usually is linked to an enzyme that then produces a product if you give it the right uh, substrate. And then we usually get a color reaction if we have a positive reaction. So that would be a direct ELISA test and in this particular case it's positive because this antigen was present in that patient's sample that we were using. And um, let's finish off this section here with the Western blot. And that's a technique where you are separating, you're using an electric field to separate our proteins. And um, you're using gel electrophoresis for that. And then you'll be transferring this profile of separated uh, proteins onto a nylon membrane or a nitrocellulose membrane. And then you're coming in with an antibody that will then target a specific protein that you think might be present in that sample that was uh, subjected to the electrophoresis. It's a pretty cool method. Uh, we're doing that at Mount SAC in cell molecular biology and bio-8, but uh, you guys don't get to do this. Okay, uh, let me start a new section uh, with phage typing, so stay tuned.